why would I want to do something crazy like that? It, it's impossible for a blind person to even contemplate stuff like that, let alone do it. When I was 28 years old, I was a school teacher, and I had uh, all of a sudden realized that sometime during the past few hours, I totally lost the sight in my left eye. Four years later, the same thing happened in the right eye. Just suddenly with no pain or anything. Now, when people ask me, how in the world did you follow the trail? The only honest answer that I can give is, God led the dog and the dog led me. I think it's a comfort to everyone to know that the Appalachian Trail exists, even if they never hike it. Inherent in every human being is the need to get back to nature at some time or another, or the need to at least know that it's there. To give people the opportunity to get back in touch with that, to get off the asphalt, and to see a night sky, to experience a view that's unfettered, to be in a place that's untrammeled, is the only time and situation that we'll really be very much reminded that we're a part of the world and that we are dependent on all other living things as they are on us. For 75 years, it has stretched from Maine to Georgia, 2,000 miles over the oldest mountains in North America. While it isn't the longest in the world anymore, the Appalachian Trail is still the benchmark for great hiking. Two men get credit for the trail, the first was a dreamer, publishing the idea in the wake of personal tragedy. He wanted to give people an escape from the cities on the mountaintops of the Appalachians, with the trail almost an afterthought. But it would be years before his ideas were actually put into practice. The second man was a no-nonsense lawyer who worried more about building a trail than building friendships. His non-stop work and demanding approach frustrated those who tried to help him and alienated those he saw standing in his way. They argued on every aspect of planning for a decade until a final disagreement after which they never spoke again. Once built, the trail attracted people from every corner of life. The first man to go from end to end in one year, a World War II veteran walking to forget his memories from the Pacific. And another, a blind man who hiked the trail behind his dog, Orient, led the entire way by a higher power. But the Appalachian Trail's greatest legacy may be the army of volunteers who run it, the devoted thousands who preserve the heritage of the beaten path. Benton Mackay was born in 1879 in the shadow of New York City. By the age of nine, Mackay moved to the New England countryside in western Massachusetts and fell in love with the outdoors. In later years, he said that by this time, the seed for the Appalachian Trail was already planted in his head. After graduating from Harvard University in 1900, Mackay took a job as a regional planner with the U.S. Forest Service. But his early ideas for the government were too broad and complicated for the time, and most were simply ignored. In 1921, tragedy focused the 42-year-old Mackay. Early that summer, his wife killed herself by jumping off a bridge into New York's East River. With no children, Mackay was now alone. His friends told him to take a break, return to the countryside, and work through his grief. Mackay took their advice and spent the summer fine-tuning his idea for the Appalachian Trail Project. In the fall, his finished essay was published in the unlikely Journal of American Institute of Architects. But Mackay's original concept looked very different from the trail today. The trail idea came together with this utopian socialism of 
work camps, farm camps, everybody up on the mountaintops um, living in peace and harmony. And the trail was the last piece of this to hook all these camps together. It wasn't an afterthought, but the, the emphasis on his work was on getting away from crowded, dusty cities and being together on the mountaintops, renewing themselves. Benton Mackay's reason for wanting it was that we're getting so much of this crowded population and, and industrialization and crowding in cities and the American, the typical American is emotionally, spiritually an outdoorsman and he needs to get away from this and it's emotionally, spiritually healthy to do that. The original plan started in North Carolina and ended 1,700 miles away on Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Mackay looked for volunteer help from the start. He contacted hiking clubs up and down the East Coast for help in his project, but little actual work was done. In 1925, four years after first publishing the idea, Mackay held a meeting with various hiking club presidents and government forestry officials. It became known as the Appalachian Trail Conference, and its leaders would act as the governing body of the Appalachian Trail. Mackay obviously was thinking in these sort of grand planning schemes, and he was dealing with planners, regional planners. The trail is a regional planning entity. And so it was very much conceptual for him. It was a, a project, but the, the kind of person who was going to actually build it was the one who liked to get out there in the woods, cut through the brush, carry a, a machete or a Pulaski or a fire rake or something like that and paint blazes on trees and, and to actually put the thing together. And so these two types had to sort of mesh in the conference before anything really got done. After the first conference, work on the AT stopped. Little was done on the trail for another two years when a 27-year-old lawyer from Maine took control of the project and pushed Mackay aside. Myron Avery was born in 1899, grew up in a small coastal fishing town in Maine. As a young man, he preferred the forest to the ocean, spending his summers working with a local timber company. After graduating from Harvard, Avery practiced maritime law, but his passion stayed in the woods of Appalachia. Avery heard about the plan to build the Appalachian Trail in 1927, six years after Benton Mackay first published his article. The young lawyer was instantly hooked for life. Avery contacted the Appalachian Trail Conference president, Judge Arthur Perkins, and just a few weeks later he organized the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club of Washington, D.C. The PATC was originally in charge of connecting trails in Shenandoah National Park to Pennsylvania. When Perkins stepped down as president in 1930, Avery took his place. The first serious trail building finally began. By pushing his volunteers to the limit and bullying local hiking clubs to build his trail, Avery's progress was impressive. In the three years since becoming president, the southern third of the trail was finished. One year after that, over 1,900 miles had been blazed. Avery also insisted on extending plans for the path into his home state, putting the end at Mount Katahdin in Maine. And throughout his time on the trail, Avery was rarely seen without his measuring wheel, meticulously counting off and recording the miles from point A to point B. He always was pushing one of those bicycle wheels, measured the exact distance, and he put up signs, and it's 1.37 miles from this point to that point. And the superintendent of the park, he laughed and laughed about that. He said, who the hell cares whether it's two tenths more or, or three tenths more? Just tell them it's five miles. He was a, a real outdoor man, though. He could uh, hike 20 miles in a day, and, and he wasn't uh, a total nut on, on these figures, but he stressed them to the point where it amused quite a few people. Avery was great as long as you agreed with his program. But it sounds like if you crossed him, if you had a different idea, he played hardball. He would freeze you out and make sure that the people who were mutual friends with you, you know, had to choose between the two of them and that, that sort of thing. 
And he was the kind of dynamic person that, you know, builds an organization. And he really did build that, that organization and, and get it going. Avery also had his own idea of what the trail should be. It was not the wilderness utopia Mackay saw. To Avery, it was a footpath for hiking, camping, and outdoor recreation. And because Avery was now in charge, Benton Mackay could only stand by and watch his original plan change. Well, there are no work camps out there, no farms out there, um, no study camps out there. The trails out there, that sort of the, the fourth element became the dominant element because the people that got excited about it were hiking, backpacking, camping clubs in New England and in the New York area. They wanted it for hiking. On August 14, 1937, a group of six volunteers finished the Appalachian Trail by clearing a section of path deep in the main woods. In just seven years, Myron Avery built the longest hiking trail in the world, over 2,000 miles from Georgia to Maine. But the man who originally thought of the idea for the Appalachian Trail did not celebrate with Avery. After battling with him over the meaning of the path for years, one final dispute would drive Benton Mackay away from the Appalachian Trail for good. <laughs> Usually uh, the normal speed is about two miles an hour. A battered pith helmet and worn work boots are part of Earl Schaefer's walking uniform. But you'd think the 79-year-old would have had just about enough of walking. The very length of it is the biggest challenge of all. Schaefer just finished hiking the Appalachian Trail, all 2,160 miles of it. When Earl Schaefer finished walking the Appalachian Trail in November of 1998, snow was already falling in Maine. It had taken him more than seven months to complete the trip. Schaefer was no ordinary hiker. The 1998 trip was his third on the Appalachian Trail, and it also marked the 50th anniversary of Schaefer's first trip. In 1948, he made history, becoming the first man to walk from Georgia to Maine in one season. Marines moving up to assault EO's entrenched garrison are exposed to fire from countless Jap positions on the eight square mile island. During the Second World War, Earl Schaefer worked as an engineer in the Pacific, installing radar towers on the islands recently occupied by American forces. But as an engineer, he was also not allowed to carry a weapon and was often a sitting duck for Japanese soldiers still in hiding. After four years of duty, Schaefer was mentally and physically drained. He had watched his best friend and hiking buddy die at Iwo Jima. When Schaefer returned to the United States, he decided to walk the army out of his system. Earl Schaefer started his solo through hike with little fanfare in early April of 1948. Traveling with an army rucksack and the bare minimum of supplies, he hiked between 15 and 20 miles a day. His plan was to move north with the spring, catching the weather at its finest. Schaefer also kept a diary of the trip, and when the mood struck him, he wrote poetry. There's a lone footpath along the crest of the Appalachian chain. On the cloud-high hills so richly blessed with sun and wind and rain. Earlier that year, Myron Avery wrote an article that said it was impossible for any hiker to complete the entire trail in one trip. Earl Schaefer's response came when he had hiked more than half of the trail. The poem was short, but its point was made. Schaefer was going to prove Myron Avery wrong. The flowers bloom, the songbirds sing, Schaefer wrote, and though it's sun or rain, I walk the mountaintops with spring from Georgia north to Maine. Earl Schaefer finished the 2,000 mile trail in four months and four days, reaching the summit of Maine's Mount Katahdin on August 5th. At first, nobody believed he had done it, but the proof was in the journal Schaefer had kept and the photographs he had taken along the way. Years later, Schaefer published Walking with Spring, a personal narrative of the first ever Appalachian Trail through hike. It's indescribable. It's just an experience of a lifetime, and, and I've done it three times. 
During the production of this documentary on May 5, 2002, Earl Schaefer died from cancer. He was 83 years old. I think Mackay, in a perfect world, would like to be out there sitting around a campfire, playing a harmonica, you know, talking with his friends and watching the stars. Whereas Avery would rather have a pack on his back, be making miles through the woods and, you know, checking the route as he went and making sure that it was, you know, it got where it was going. He was not a contemplative in the way Mackay was. Inspiring his forest army by a personal visit, President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Shenandoah Valley. It's very good to be here at these Virginia CCC camps. I wish I could see them all over the country. I hope that all over the country they're in as fine condition as the camps that I've seen today. At the height of the Depression in 1935, a government proposal for a skyline drive through Shenandoah National Park would pit the Appalachian Trail's two founding fathers against each other in one final battle. The highway would open up the park to driving tourists and give hundreds of unemployed workers a job. Myron Avery also thought the road gave easy access to the Appalachian Trail, but to Benton Mackay, it was a violation of his original vision. Mackay was very interested in the idea of wilderness as a place to retreat from things like roads and businesses and tourists and things like that. He wanted it to really have a sense of separation. Mackay thought that by bringing that road in right next to the trail and getting the government involved in that side of it, that the, the whole purpose of sort of the trails as a place to retreat from those things was compromised. The popularity of the car was exploding throughout the country and Skyline Drive was seen as a grand tourist attraction for the millions of city drivers in Philadelphia, Washington, and Richmond. Not only would Skyline Drive share the mountaintops Mackay originally saw belonging exclusively to his trail, but the roadway would actually be built on top of the Appalachian Trail. Avery said, well, uh, in practice, we've just got to compromise with the park, and uh, they want their Skyline Drive, and we'll zigzag in and out, and uh, in certain places they'll be so distant from us that we can't hear the cars, but other times we're just going to have to put up with it. That's the only way we can get it. This was Avery's baby, and Mackay was coming back in and saying, no, this is, you know, I had the idea. This is what I think it should be like. You've got it all wrong, and you need to defer to me. And Avery said, the heck with that. Let's put it to a vote. Avery was the lawyer, and Avery was the politician, and they got this big conference up on Skyline Drive, and uh, Avery's group won. You know, they put it to a vote, and Mackay sort of sniffed and said, well, I don't think I'll have anything to do with this anymore then. The Appalachian Trail would have to be rerouted through Shenandoah National Park. Originally seen in Mackay's vision as an escape from the industrial world, the trail would now cross the highway over 30 times in little more than 100 miles. Frustrated, Mackay disassociated himself with the Appalachian Trail Conference and the trail itself for decades. Mackay also never spoke to Avery again. You know, they both loved the wilderness. And they both had enjoyed walking and they enjoyed the out outdoors. They also felt deep down, I think, that their vision for what it should be was worth the right one. And those were not completely complementary visions. Avery rooted the trail over a lot of roads. He rooted it through towns. If he couldn't build a trail that wandered, you know, through the woods, he put it on a little side road so that people could actually walk it. And Mackay was just not all that interested in that. He wasn't interested in it as a walking route in terms of, you know, getting from Maine to Georgia. He, he, he saw it as a place to go. The Appalachian Trail was Myron Avery's passion, and he continued to work on it for another 17 years. When World War II began, the trail was neglected for other more important causes, and large sections grew over and became impassable. After the war, Avery again set to work, clearing the path from Georgia to Maine and reopening the trail in 1951. Exhausted in poor health and with his trail finally in good hands, Avery retired from the Appalachian Trail Conference the next year. While vacationing with his son that summer, Avery died from a massive heart attack 
his colleagues said he died from overwork. Avery was only 52 years old. Following his death, hundreds of letters were sent to the Appalachian Trail Conference as tributes for Avery's work on the AT. Not one was from Benton Mackay. Benton Mackay gradually came back to the Appalachian Trail. Since 1936, he had founded and acted as president for the Wilderness Society. Now he returned to his original love, and the trail welcomed him. Mackay continued to be associated with the trail and its organizers until 1975. That December 11th, Benton Mackay died in his sleep. He was three months shy of his 97th birthday. Benton Mackay was famous for a quote he made about wilderness. He said, wilderness is two things, it's fact and feeling. It's the abstract and the concrete. Mackay provided the feeling, I think. He provided the abstract out there, and, and Avery provided the concrete. The first day, the first step, when I got out of that pickup truck on Springer Mountain, I had forgotten to ask the driver of the truck which way north was. And within 200 feet from the time I picked up the dog's harness and gave him the command of forward, he very abruptly turned left. And I followed him. And for three days, I had no clue about where I was. I didn't even know I was on a trail. That third afternoon, I ran into these people. They were trail maintainers, and the rain had subsided. And the first question I had is, where in the world am I? And the guy said, you're on the Appalachian Trail, and you're headed north. 20 years ago, Bill Irwin's life was a mess. Frustrated and bitter about his sudden blindness, he was, in his words, overweight while smoking and drinking too much. But gradually he reformed himself, a change that was finished when he fixed his relationship with his estranged son. Irwin says he could not have made those changes on his own, so he turned to God and asked how he could repay his good fortune. Shortly after that, Irwin says he was led to the Appalachian Trail. Come on, where you come? Come, on, come. In the early spring of 1991, Irwin and his seeing eye dog, Orient, started on their way towards Maine. However, ill-equipped and ill-prepared for the trip, he suffered constantly. So I never took a painless step. Every five minutes, I wanted to quit. Or every 10 minutes, I'd say to myself, you know, this isn't for me. I'm ready to go home. I, I was sitting in front of my fireplace when I planned this insanity. And I want to go back there and unplan it right now. But I still had that nagging that says you've got to keep going. By the time he had walked the 1,700 miles to Maine, Irwin says his body was getting weaker every day. The early northern winter had already arrived. Hypothermia, or frostbite to his hands, could have killed him. But Irwin continued up the trail. And I was all alone. See, there was no one else out there. The weather was bad, and it was life-threatening every day. So when I got to the end, I all, uh, all I can think about is kissing that sign and thinking, whoop de do. You know, it's over, so what? Just the accomplishment has no meaning, whatever. But the journey and all of those experiences changed my life forever. Today, Irwin tours the country as a public speaker. He retells his adventures and what he learned from them to anybody who will listen. Most people do. I really, I want to uh, hike the Appalachian Trail. Like, it's a goal of mine. Bill Irwin's Appalachian Trail hike was the turning point in his life. The trail is an escape for the hundreds of people who hiked it before him and the thousands who have hiked it since. As Benton Mackay originally envisioned, it gives those buried by civilization a way to return to Mother Nature. It's a place where you really begin to focus on you know, the essential elements of life. Simple uh, interactions with other people, uh, where the distractions and the complications of life at large are set aside out there along the trail.
It's sort of cool when you get there and you see the blazes and you say, where did these end up? And somebody says, Maine. You know, that's a cool thing. You say, you know, I can walk to Maine. And that's a very powerful thought that sort of gets planted in people's minds. They say, you know, I really have been promising myself that I've got to do something like this. You know, get out there. Just forget all this stuff I'm, that's part of my life right now. I'm just going to get out there and walk for a while. It's not about getting there, it's about going. 